Our fourth speaker in this forum, I'm delighted to have uh, Councillor Glenn DeBeermaker from the City of Toronto. He's going to give us a perspective on interests within the City of Toronto and beyond. Glenn was elected to Toronto Council in 2003 and is well known as being a strong voice for local citizens. Glenn is also known as a friend of the environment and has spent decades advocating for many important environmental issues. Shortly after finishing his MA at the University of Toronto, Glenn became at age 25 one of the leaders of the fight to preserve Scarborough's magnificent Rouge Valley. Glenn hand drew the boundaries of the proposed National Provincial Park and has spent over 25 years pursuing this dream. He is a passion. I worked with uh, Glenn on the Rouge Park Alliance for quite a number of years. During his many years of environmental ad advocacy, Glenn also helped mobilize thousands of citizens in defense of the 160 kilometer long Oak Ridge Moraine. Great to have you, Glenn. Come on up. Great. Uh, everyone, uh, I'm very pleased to be here today. and. Uh, uh, I did start off uh, when I was 25 years old, and that was 26 years ago. Uh, I would like to take a very quick moment to introduce two of my staff members who are also environmental advocates, Sujanthi Manavan, Manavanan, sorry, if you can stand up, and Neha Bhatia. Uh, at 22 and 25 years old, this will be the next generation of people drawing boundaries of national parks. And I certainly hope we have this issue sufficiently addressed so that they don't have to pass uh, the bylaws and the regulations on large-scale fill, fill projects, because uh, I don't know if they'll be elected within the next four or five years. Uh, but certainly, uh, we're in good hands, and uh, I think the, the, the terrain is uh, changing. Uh, I'm also, in addition to being a City uh, of Toronto Councillor, and, and yes, we still do have a mayor today, I, I've just uh, heard through the uh, internet. Um, I'm a member of the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority as well, for for nine years. Uh, we have uh, 28 members, about 20 of them are uh, elected officials uh, from Whitby and Pickering and Uxbridge and Stouffville and Richmond Hill and Mississauga and they actually have a meeting today so I've uh, missed that meeting to be here today. Uh, so I'm, I, I am a little bit worried that when I go back they're going to say, Glenn, while you were away that one meeting, we put you on a whole bunch of committees that you didn't want to be on, but nobody else wanted to be on, so you were volunteered to sit on in 12 different uh, governing, governance committees that uh, you're going to have to spend a lot of time on. Uh, and I, I think the message I want to convey here today, I, I bring perhaps more of a, a political uh, analysis to this uh, issue than a, a technical analysis, uh, is that at the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority and the municipalities um, in, in, the, I'll call it the South, um, there is overwhelming political support for action on this issue. There is overwhelming political support today that I have not seen in my 26 years of environmental advocacy. So my hope from this conference is that the good people who have organized this and brought us all together, and I have to say this is a pretty large brain trust uh, in this one gym. I hope there's not a meteor coming towards us right now because then we might, you know, we might be in a little bit of trouble. But we have enough experience and wisdom and knowledge and dedication in this room to come up with the recommendations that we all need to carry on and make sure we get implemented. And I'm, I guess I'm here saying, uh, from a political level, I think if the result of this symposium is a 10-point action plan or recommendations at both the provincial and municipal levels of what we, and conservation authority levels of what we should do, um, there's no guarantees in life, but I'm very, very confident that this set of recommendations will be acted upon and will be adopted and, and very quickly. Um, I'd like to just uh, touch base uh, on my own experiences because I, uh, again, uh, Phil right now for most of us, probably even in this room, uh, and certainly as, as a citizen, if you're talking about Phil, you're talking about a problem. It's, Phil is bad, dirt is bad, trucks are bad, <laughs> dust is bad, smell is bad, contaminated chemicals, bad. So uh, there, there are a lot of problems in the industry right now, and I think it's our job because the, the fill is not going to go away. We're not going to stop building subways or LRT lines. We're not going to stop building roads and highways. City of Toronto is not going to stop building sewer pipes, and certainly uh, York Region isn't going to stop building sewer pipes. So there's going to be fill. Fill happens. What we have to decide is what are we going to do with that? Are we going to allow fill to, to be a problem? 
that, that we all fight over and have a lot of grief and heartache and cost um, and, and conflict? Uh, or are we going to try to, as best we can, minimize that conflict and maximize the opportunities? And uh, one of the suggestions I'm putting forward is uh, we can actually create a new um, series of nature sanctuaries across southern Ontario thanks to Phil. And I don't think I would have been saying this 10 years ago, but I have uh, seen a lot of amazing things, and I'm going to share just a few of them with you. And to let you know that uh, there are many tools in the toolbox that we need, but part of it is when we look at that fill, the fill is, there's, where it's going to have to provide for our residents and for the environment that we all love a net positive benefit. In fact, I, I would call them, if you can look at a fill site as a nature sanctuary, I think the, uh, the whole discussion will change. And uh, it'll take a lot of work because uh, there's a lot of bad uh, experiences out there and people have long memories, but I, I think you can turn things around. And I've just started off with a slide with uh, Tommy Thompson Park where the Leslie Street spit. Um, this site has taken about 80 million cubic meters of fill. So I, I guess this is part of a made in Toronto solution. Uh, we uh, didn't get most of the, our, our uh, concrete and our gravel and our stone and our rock. Now we're getting it from the Oak Ridges Moraine. Uh, we used to get it from Lake Ontario. We just dredged the entire lake in front of the city of Toronto and did a lot of damage and a lot of destruction. Uh, and when we had fill, we just dumped it. In fact, most of the cities, uh, you know, if you go down to Front Street, uh, you're on fill. Um, this is actually a fill project that, in the end, and it's still up for debate because there would be people who would challenge me and say this thing should have never happened and it's a monstrosity and it's bad for water quality. But I think. Uh, Given the reality of what we have and, and the requirements, um, this is a fill project that in the end overall will have a net positive benefit both on the terrestrial or the land side and actually in the lake as well because a lot of people will say, well, this is an, this is an in-water project which has, and it certainly does have more challenges, but compared to the devastation that we did to this part of the lake bed, uh, th this has actually more habitat today than we had a hundred years ago. Um, maybe not 300 years ago before we were here, but certainly in terms of, of our evolving uh, urban form, um, I think we're going to look at this as actually a, a success story. Here we had about a thousand trucks a day delivering fill to this site. They're still delivering fill to this site. Um, and it could probably take about a million cubic meters more fill on this site. So uh, it's taken fill for 50 or 60 years. I think the site was opened in 53, so I, I guess about 60 years, and it'll be open for a while more. Again, probably um, another million cubic meters, which is quite a, quite a bit of fill. Um, but I would think most of us, if uh, you went to any of your own local residents and said, we've got a great idea, we're going to take a million cubic meters of fill and put it on this uh, farmer's field or this old, old quarry, m most of them would get very, very agitated and angry and their faces would turn red and they would clutch their chests and they would m tell you that you'll never ever be elected ever again in, in the province of Ontario. Um, and you don't need that as, as an elected official. You don't want that to happen, and that's not a good thing for anybody. Uh, war and fights are very costly on so many levels. But we have a site here that's 80 million cubic meters of fill, and more to come, which is now um, the poster child of a lot of environmental organizations. And we have people like the um, uh, Ontario Naturalists, for example, leading uh, nature hikes down in this area every single weekend. So people flock to this area now as a, as a place of recreation and, and as a place of um, uh, uh, nature enjoyment. And if you look here, this is a globally significant, important bird area. And you have to think of that. Um, this is, I mean, this is it. We've created in the city of Toronto uh, an area that's globally significant out of dirt. Uh, I don't think we actually knew that we were going to do that when we started the project, but this is the result and it shows you that something good can actually happen, especially if you plan it in advance and you try to do it right at the beginning. Um, so we have the largest colony of cormorants in the Great Lakes at the foot of the city of Toronto. We have the largest colony of black-crowned night herons in Canada. 
Uh, and this, when you go through the migration period, I, I take folks down there uh, to band birds in the spring and watch the spring migration. So it, again, is something that in the end has turned out, I, I would say, to be a, 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 a net positive impact. Um, this picture was taken uh, last year, March of 2012. Uh, note, snowy owls aren't always uh, down there, uh, but when they do come in, uh, we get hundreds hundreds of people going down there with their, their zoom lenses uh, to, to t take a look at these birds. So it is really quite uh, an attraction in the city of Toronto. These are two pictures as, as well of our landfill site. And as you can see, if those were your kids in the uh, photo on the right hand side walking down that trail, in fact, if I showed you this and told you this is my cottage, you'd up in Bancroft, you'd probably say, yeah, that, yeah, okay, that's Glen's Cottage, nice, nice little uh, rural lane. Uh, that's in downtown Toronto on, on a fill site. Um, the meadow on the left, again, and these are relatively new, uh, so they haven't had the decades to mature yet, um, but you can see that if, if I said to you, if I showed you that picture and I said, there's a nature sanctuary, my guess is you'd say, yeah, okay, it's a nature sanctuary. Is that part of the Rouge National Park or which park is that? Um, so again, you can have a net positive uh, impact uh, if you do it right. Uh, the Brock Road and North, uh, Brock Road North and South restoration concept. Uh, some folks here uh, may have uh, heard of that as well. This is a site that I'm very proud of, and we'll see a couple of slides. Um, the city of Toronto owned this site. It was a thousand acres, roughly a thousand acres. We donated it to the Conservation Authority for two dollars, and this site is going to accept 1.3 million cubic meters of fill. So again, I would challenge any of you, if you, if you went to your local residence and said, we've got a project here down the road that's going to accept 1 million or 1.3 million cubic meters of fill, you'd probably have a lot of very agitated people. But we're doing something at Brock Road that I think will again serve as a model for folks to say, you know what, again, if you do it right, and I'm gonna to get to those requirements sort of at the, end of, at the end of my presentation, if you do it right, you might actually create a na nature sa sanctuary out of something that most people see as, as a liability. So this is the map, again, this is a sort of south of here, closer to Pickering. So the red line shows the landfill site that was a former quarry. It had been worked out. In fact, if you go there in parts of it now, you're just down to bedrock. Nothing grows, not even strangling dog vine. <laughs> Nothing grows. It's rock. Uh, so uh, in terms of restoring the site, there wasn't, well, at one level, there wasn't a lot of, it was very difficult, almost impossible to restore, but uh, post the 1.3, uh, million cubic meters of fill, this will be a nature sanctuary. And I just want to read the quote from one of our staff reports um, that uh, this is a, a technical report that the uh, Conservation Authority staff gave to us at the authority meeting, that this site, it's next to the Greenwood Conservation Area, which is also about 1,000 acres. So you can imagine 1,000 acres and 1,000 acres put together isn't twice as good, it's three or four times as good. But the quote from the staff report is this has the potential to become one of the most significant natural heritage parcels south of the Oak Ridges Moraine in the Toronto Region Conservation uh, Authority's jurisdiction. So think of that. We're, we're taking a site that was a former garbage dump and quarry, putting a million cubic meters of fill on it, and our staff still state publicly and in writing that this is going to be, become one of the most significant natural heritage parcels in our region. It's, it's just incredible. And the reason for that is a lot of uh, very good scientific planning and, and fill placement uh, on, on this site. And I would say my submission to, to us as an audience and to the uh, members of, of elected council that are here today is that we need to own and operate some of our own fill sites like this. Because you know who I trust the most to take care of fill? The government. And I know these people will laugh and say, well, usually we don't trust the government. But in this case, from my experience of two and a half decades uh, fighting for the environment, I would rather send Toronto's fill to a designated landfill site or a, a fill site uh, that's going to be properly maintained, maintained like this. Um, you can see here, just in, in terms of our, our deliverables, it's, it's about a $9 million renaturalization or restoration project. And if, if most of us went to our local councils asking for $2 million or $6 million for restoration to create a nature sanctuary, I don't think we'd be successful in the budget process. Uh, but we're taking the revenues from the fill and putting it back into the site. Uh, we're going to create 26 hectares of new uh, wetland habitat, um, again, at no cost to the taxpayer. 
this is a site uh, at the um, Reese Road wetland site within the Rouge Valley National Park. So within our national park, in a national park that is very near and dear to me, we are accepting fill within the boundaries of the national park and we are using that fill to create provincially significant wetlands. And you can see from this photograph we, we took uh, in between two massive forests for the city of Toronto, our two largest forests in the city were separated by this uh, con about a concession block or so of, of um, cornfield and you can see the aftershot right there of, of uh, creating a wetland where we had a cornfield. Uh, so we've actually had again a net increase in uh, biological diversity. The construction at the beginning doesn't look uh, that beautiful and that's why your residents complain about the trucks and the dust and the noise and the oil and everything that they see looks very ugly. If you did it right and you had the public participation, if you had regulation, you'd be able to tell them this is what we've done in other sites and this is the uh, final product and maybe you'll see a bit more patience. The Bob Hunter Memorial Park again fill uh, to planting to meadowland and, and look at that and that's just all within, it's less than one year. Uh, so the changes are remarkable. Um, Bob Hunter I met uh, in my 20s. Um, he, I, would, I would call him a mentor after I gave him a, a five minute speech on why we should protect the Rouge Valley as a national wildlife treasure. He just looked at me and said, okay, now throw me a bone. I said, what is a bone? What are you talking about? He said, Glenn, this is TV. You got to get your message across in 20 seconds. And, um, you know, I'm 25 years later, I still can't do it in 20 seconds. Uh, that's why I'm glad I have almost 15 minutes to uh, do this presentation. But that is a fill site. And I think a lot of your residents would be happy to take a hike through that fill site. Again, we've done it out in the Humber watershed as well, taking a degraded site and turn it into a vibrant and alive nature sanctuary. You can get your citizens involved and all you have to do is plant it and they will come. It is incredible to see what happens out there on the field. So I'm going to summarize by saying uh, that in my opinion, from a political perspective, we can control and regulate fill from the site or from excavation to its final destination or its deposition, that's what we have to do. And I think a lot of folks up north of Steeles Avenue would be a lot more comfortable if they actually knew where the fill came from, what was in it, that it was safe, and that was going to a place that was properly controlled, and at the end of their day, their kids would have an amazing hiking and biking trail to enjoy, and that they'd actually have a nature sanctuary at the end of it. The City of Toronto, will support whatever recommendations come out of this symposium. Again, no guarantees in life. There are 45 of us on council, but there is an overwhelming majority on the City of Toronto Council uh, to do the right thing. We're banning shark fin soup in the City of Toronto. Uh, we're going to do uh, take care of Phil as well. So the City of Toronto has already passed a motion saying that we want a consistent, regulated at the provincial level, because I think that's absolutely essential, um, uh, regime. We want the province to be involved. We don't want a hundred different municipalities to have a hundred different regulations, some strong, some weak, some just non-existent. We need that provincial protection. As well though, we want Toronto and other municipalities to pass the bylaws for our procurement policies that say when you build the new subway along Eglinton Avenue, which again is probably about a million cubic meters of fill, don't just take it away, this is how you're going to do it and there's a process and there's a best practice and there's a lot of really good things that we can do, but it's required. Right now in the City of Toronto, it is not required. We do not test our, our, our fill when people are digging foundations or subway tunnels or putting in sewer pipes. We have to change that and I hope you'll give us that set of recommendations and we'll do the easy part of getting the votes at Council to do it. Um, I'd like to say, I think, again, just to wrap up, um, we want to make sure that there are authorized locations to take fill. They may be private sector sites, they may be public sector sites. I like the public sector sites, but we know even if it's a private sector site, that's a private sector that's a site that's cooperated with the local municipality and actually has some uh, protections in place. So I want to conclude to say yes, we do need regulations. Yes, we have to test the soils at the point of origin. And yes, we have massive public and political support to do what we all want to do. So I ask you as, as, as a symposium, give us the recommendations and we'll make sure it gets adopted across Southern Ontario. Thank you very much.